welcome you to the 2021 Spring Franciscan Zoom Lectures, hosted by the Franciscan School of Theology. Our presenter tonight, Dr. Juliet Mousseau, RSCJ, holds a master's degree and doctorate from St. Louis University in historical theology. She taught historical theology at the University of Dallas School of Ministry for two years before entering the Society of Sacred Heart. From 2012 to present, she has been a professor of the church history at the Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis. We are excited to share that she will join the faculty here at the Franciscan School of Theology at the University of San Diego this summer as the Vice President for Academic Affairs. She made her final profession as a religious of the Sacred Heart in January 2020. Her latest work is an edited volume of medieval sources entitled Life at St. Victor. I welcome Sister Juliet Musso. I think. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle, for the lovely welcome. And I'm very grateful to be here and excited to be joining the FSD community uh, this summer. So I'm, I'm glad to have this little introduction as well to uh, some of my work. Um, my, my confession is that though we have Hugh of St. Victor and Bonaventure on the screen, my specialty is really around the School of St. Victor. So I'll be focusing more on Hugh of St. Victor and touch on a few things from Bonaventure as well. Um, so that's my caveat that, that the focus will be on Hugh of St. Victor. So first of all, just a brief uh, description of what we'll be doing this evening. First of all, I want to introduce the scene and the characters. So most of the action will take place in Paris at the Abbey of St. Victor. Uh, the two main characters we'll talk about are Hugh of St. Victor and St. Bonaventure, and I will introduce their their lives a bit at the beginning. Then we'll delve a little more deeply into Hugh of St. Victor's educational plan and curriculum. And then finally, how education, both for Hugh and Bonaventure, is connected to human transformation. So what is the role of education in transformation? And then finally, some of my thoughts on what this really means for us today uh, in this world, in our theological education realm. So we'll begin with the School of St. Victor in Paris. The drawing behind the, the words on the screen is a, an image of the School of St. Victor from, I think, the 16th century. And it's a little faded out so you can read the words, but you can see behind that there are some, some bricks that are on the ground. In the foreground, there are also some, some walls that seem to be starting to, to fall apart. The, the abbey was founded in 1108 and really the height of the abbey was, was over by about the year 1200. It continued to exist until the French Revolution uh, when it was really um, destroyed, the buildings were destroyed. Uh, so, so it was a short-lived uh, school and yet at the same time the writings and the ideas that come out of the School of St. Victor are pretty influential on later theologians Bonaventure especially. Uh, founded in 1108 by William of Champeau, he became the first master of the school and he wanted to found this sort of monastic life for parish priests. So the idea at the time is that there were basically uh, monks and priests in the service of the church and the monks were not priests. That's a little different today. Many monks today are priests. And they tended to live in communities somewhat isolated, but also participating in the, the daily life of the community in a, in a communal way, not, not as a priestly figure. Uh, so William of Champeau wanted parish priests to have the benefit of community life. So he built the, the abbey outside the walls of Paris, and it was on the site of a hermitage dedicated to St. Victor of Marseille. This was sort of an experimental form of religious life. 
It was about a century before the mendicant orders were founded. And so it marks a transition period between the strictly monastic view and a new form of religious life in which people were out of the monastery and serving in the world in a very active way. This is in between. They're doing both. They're living in a monastic situation and they are serving in the community. In addition to uh, uh, serving in the, the parishes around, they also had an external school where boys from the community would come to learn. Uh, one of the major figures there was Hugh of St. Victor, who started teaching in the 1120s, uh, and he was a very well-known teacher and attracted students. So with his arrival at St. Victor, then the school began to be much more popular. People came just to go to the school there. This school formed one of the precursors to the University of Paris, which is one of the earliest universities uh, in the Western world. We'll turn now to Hugh of St. Victor himself. This image is purported to be Hugh teaching some of his uh, monks, I think, rather than external students. There's not a lot known about his early life. He was born around the year 1096, either in the Duchy of Saxony in modern day Germany or in Flanders in modern day Belgium. And historians are not certain. The early details of his life are a bit sketchy it's believed that he came to Paris to study as a young man and then returned some years later to enter the Abbey. By 1120, we know that he had arrived at St. Victor and started writing and teaching. And then around 1127, he was named the master of the school and then the head of the school in 1133. So he was a master in that he was, he was formally teaching and then head of the school and that he had control over the curriculum and the pedagogy. He had many writings in different areas, particularly faith, morals, contemplation, and spirituality. He wrote biblical commentary, commentaries, sermons, a rule for novices, and spiritual treatises. His most famous works are called the Didascalicon, which does not have a good translated title in English, but it's uh, it's his plan of studies and pedagogy. And then a second writing known as the De Sacramentis, which in English is known as, the, as On the Sacraments of the Christian Faith. He died on February 11th, 1141. A word about uh, one of these works, the De Sacramentis, On the Sacraments of the Christian Faith. You can see that he has it divided into two books and the first book goes, uh, goes through creation and basically the content of the Old Testament. So uh, creation, causes of things, human beings, the first sin, the institution of the sacraments, which he has a particular understanding of, and then natural law and written law. Book two then begins with the incarnation of the word and goes through basically the content of the Christian faith. So this, in a sense, is his outline of how uh, both uh, sacred history works. So we have the, the written law, the natural law, written law, and then uh, Christ and Christianity. And also it's his idea, it reflects his idea of education that he believed that with creation, when human beings were created, they started with the first sin. They started to turn away from God and progressively get further away. In order to be restored, then the sun came, began the process of, in, of, of our restoration to the glory of God. So book one is that going out and book two is that return, the restoration of humanity to the image that God had implanted within us. This is important because he also viewed education as the means of restoration. So our turning around and facing toward God to return began with the incarnation, but we progress through education toward that greater uh, identity as a human person, that, that um, restored image of what God had imagined for us. In order to do that then, he writes in the Didascalicon 
that we have to learn everything. Learn everything, he says. You will see afterwards that nothing is superfluous. A skimpy knowledge is not a pleasing thing. So learn everything, no big deal. Um, his program really uh, told people how to go about that. So what you would start with, how you would progress, and how you would learn all of these different things in order to, to really fundamentally return to that image of God, be restored to what God had created us to be. Uh, and just an aside, in some of the historical notes, there's, a, there's an idea that one of the reasons the School of St. Victor did not last is because this was a little too ambitious for most students. Uh, so, so most students just stopped coming because they couldn't manage this whole knowledge. I don't know if that's really true, uh, but it's an interesting thought. The second figure we wanna look at is St. Bonaventure. He was born in Bagno Reggio in central Italy in 1217. At that time, the Franciscan order was well established and rapidly growing. Francis died when Bonaventure was nine and when Bonaventure was 11, he was canonized. He then at age 17, Bonaventure went to the University of Paris to study the liberal arts. So now we are beginning to see the conflation of these figures. At the university, he encountered the Franciscans for the first time. Then in 1243, he entered the Franciscan order and studied under the Franciscan theologians, Alexander of Hales and John of La Rochelle. He eventually succeeded them as masters of theology and stayed there at the University of Paris until 1257 when he was elected the minister general of the order. He was named a Cardinal in 1273 and then died in 1274 at the Second Council of Lyon. He was canonized in 1482 and named a doctor of the church in 1588. His writings fill feet of shelves. He wrote, he wrote a ton of material. Um, and we're not going to look at all except one little book called On the Reduction of the Arts to Theology, because that's where we connect to Hugh of St. Victor. In On the Reduction of the Arts to Theology, Bonaventure says that Anselm excels in reasoning, Bernard, that's Bernard of Clairvaux, in preaching, Richard of St. Victor, one of Hugh's uh, brothers at the Abbey, in contemplation, but Hugh of St. Victor excels in all three. <laughs> so we know, um, not just because of this, but because he quotes Hugh of St. Victor throughout his writings, that he was deeply influenced by the ideas of Hugh as well. And a word about the title of this writing, On the Reduction of the Arts to Theology. Reduction is not reduction as we typically think of it, but in the sense of leading back. The Latin term dux means to lead. So re, redux, lead back. We're getting into that restoration of humanity, leading us back to God. The arts, uh, we tend to think of the arts as performance or beautiful things as being art, but he really is including all different elements of human activity. So the major factors we're going to speak about are the mechanical arts and the liberal arts, and we'll come back to those in a minute. For all of this, it's knowledge that leads us to mystery, to union with God. And ultimately, all of that knowledge is for the purpose of studying scripture. So theology, the reduction of the arts to theology, at this time in history, in the 12th and 13th centuries, theology was one field of study. Today, it divides out into scripture and systematics and liturgical theology and moral theology. But there was no division in that point. So studying theology was really fundamentally the study of scripture and everything that we consider different branches of theology might be included in that as well. So we return to our school of St. Victor and start to look at their education in some detail. Hugh of St. Victor established the curriculum at St. Victor and his preliminary studies gradually led the student to study scripture and then progress through all of the books of scripture in an orderly fashion from the ones that are easier to understand to those that are more difficult. Education began with a wide array of studies 
that range from practical skills for survival, like hunting or building things, to the higher levels of philosophy, so logic and metaphysics. He further divide, divided knowledge into two primary areas, knowledge of words, so what words mean and how they are used and how they are pronounced, and knowledge of things, so uh, what, what things signify, what they are, what they mean, the nature of things, Words are learned through the study of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. And things are studied through arithmetic, music, geometry, physics. Some of the more basic arts that one might learn are the mechanical arts. Things like fabric making. These are his, this is his list of seven fabric making, armament. Um, this means what we think of as armament, so weaponry, but it also means building things. So the image on the right is, I believe, an example of armament. Commerce, which is exactly as we think of it, buying and selling things. Agriculture, hunting, medicine, and theatrics. Theatrics is basically any form of entertainment. Um, so it is connected to that word for theater as well. Now, we don't think of these as necessary elements to studying scripture, but Hugh really did. And he gives us an example of why it's so important. His example has to do with shipbuilding. So he's talking about Noah's Ark. And he says, you know, ancient uh, theologians believed that the Ark had to be in the shape of a pyramid. I'm not sure why, <laughs> but that the Ark had to be in the shape of a pyramid. And he says, basically, if they had known anything about building ships, they would know that a pyramid does not float. So, so he has this very practical reason, right? You have to know what's going to float if you're going to try to uh, understand what's going on with Noah's Ark. He also talks about the liberal arts. Um, these are the, the seven areas that I mentioned before. The trivium are the three liberal arts of grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic, which help us to understand words and their meanings. Uh, he also throws in their pronunciation. And the, the other four liberal arts are the quadrivium, arithmetic, music, geometry, and physics. In addition to all of these arts, uh, he also advocated the study of wisdom, philosophy. Uh, and again, philosophy, like all of the other arts, is something that leads toward theology. So it's an assistant to understanding scripture. It is not the height of knowledge. He was also known for pedagogical skills. So he much learning at this point in time was, was around, was memorized. So he developed ways for students to memorize things. He has a chart that allows you to memorize the Psalms in order so that you could, if someone said, uh, what is Psalm 47? You would be able to recite it and know what it was. Following the study of liberal arts, then a student could proceed to the study of divine science. This is the subject matter for the restoration of humanity. And it begins with three senses of scripture, three different ways to read scripture. So these might be familiar as well. The three ways to understand scripture are the historical or literal, the allegorical, and the tropological or moral. And Hugh describes these in the De Sacramentis in the, on, the, on the sacraments of the Christian faith. He says, quote, now of this subject matter, divine science treats according to a threefold sense. That is according to history, allegory, and tropology. History is the narration of events, which is contained in the first meaning of the letter. So meaning of the letter is like the literal meaning. We have allegory when, through what is said to have been done, something else is signified as done, either in the past or in the present or the future. 
We have tropology when through what is said to have been done, it is signified that something ought to be done. So history, understanding literally what happened. Allegory helps us understand what it signifies. And tropology helps us understand what that tells us we should do, how we should behave. Hugh regards each of these very carefully and they have to be used properly. He says basically that you can't treat every passage of scripture as historical or every passage of scripture for an allegorical meaning, but that certain parts of scripture are more appropriately understood literally or allegorically. So for instance, he gives the example of the book of Kings and says basically this should be understood as narrative. That's primarily what it is. Others such as the Song of Songs should be read allegorically. And then others like Proverbs are more properly read as moral instruction. So there's a progression. We learn the narrative, what God has done. We learn the allegory. What does this mean for our faith? And then we learn how it is that we ought to behave. For Hugh then also these three must be done in order. And each one must be really understood before progressing into the next. So we're going to look at each three, each of these three in turn, beginning, of course, with a historical or literal sense. Hughes' first interpretation of scripture is the literal meaning of the text. This is to be understood before anything else. The student must commit to memory the events and their details before attempting to extract deeper meaning from them. For this first step, knowledge of the words is the primary goal. This knowledge of words includes both pronunciation and grammar, and also the meaning of the words. And he says that this study should be approached in order of time, historically. So he gives a list of books which he thinks are most essential to the study. Genesis, and here's a, an illustration of Genesis as well. Genesis, Exodus, Joshua, Judges, Kings, Chronicles, the four Gospels, and the Acts of the Apostles. And he says, see how from the time when the world began until the end of the age, the mercies of God do not slacken. He acknowledges that for this study of history, there are certain types of study aids that can aid the student in memorizing these ideas. He has two that he wrote. One is called the Chronicon, and the other is called the Descriptio Mape Mundi, a description of the maps of the world. The Chronicon includes a series of synoptic tables concerning biblical and ecclesiastical history. So it's basically these lists that you can memorize in order to remember the history of Christianity of the world. And then the Mapa Mundi, the map of the world, names the cities and people, rivers, mountains, and other geographical and political features and divisions of the world. And I looked for an image to share with you and could not find one, very disappointingly. <laughs> While the literal understanding of scripture focuses on words, the student now turns to the study of things with the al allegorical sense of scripture. In, in knowing things, we know them by their number and their dimension. And we know things by also their interior quality or their nature. While we use words as signs for things, the things are more important because they contain the essence of what they are in themselves. They aren't bound to the language we put around them. The allegorical sense of scripture illuminates for the student the doctrinal teachings of the church. And so the work on the sacraments of the Christian faith is entirely devoted to the allegorical meaning of scripture. Uh, and this image is, is an example of what this might look like. So the upper part of the image uh, is, is <laughs> probably hard to tell, but it's an image of Noah's Ark. They didn't have a pyramid, but they had sort of a dome. Um, and Noah's Ark then is being related to the baptism of Christ. So we have 
something, some image or story, historical story from the Old Testament, then being related to the reality of who Christ is for us today. Hugh believes that allegory is something that shouldn't be approached until you're pretty well established in the historical understanding of the, the text. So he also says that you shouldn't do it yourself, <laughs> that this requires a good teacher. He also says, quote, the study demands not slow and dull perceptions, but matured mental abilities, which in the course of their searching may restrain their subtlety so that they do not lose good judgment about what they discern. So you've got to be fairly with it to approach the study of allegory, according to Hugh. It's helpful here to pause and examine a symbol that Hugh uses. He imagines scripture study as a building under construction. The historical sense is the foundation and the allegorical sense forms the walls. The tropological sense is the roof. Using this image then, when he's building the walls, he says there are eight levels that are built into the walls on top of the historical foundation. And those levels are the Trinity, creation, sin and its punishment, the mysteries of human restoration first instituted under natural law, the written law, the mystery of the incarnation, the mysteries of the New Testament, and the mysteries of the resurrection of humankind. So these eight levels of brick or whatever you want to call it, the eight levels that we build into our house, those are the foundations of our Christian faith. And that's what, that's what we are learning as we read the text through allegory. The roof then is the tropological sense of scripture or the moral meaning of the text. So Hugh describes the fruit of sacred reading as twofold, to instruct the mind and to form morals. So the first two readings are as instructing the mind along with all of the knowledge before scripture and forming morals is where we are now. Knowing Christian doctrine is not enough. One must also contemplate the works of God. Scripture forms morals through example and instruction. So for example, Jesus here is healing the blind man. Jesus teaches us by showing us what to do and he teaches us by telling us what to do. That too becomes a, a phrase that they use at the Abbey of St. Victor among the brothers to teach by word and example. So all of your actions should show virtuous behavior because people are learning from you as they see you going about your day. The scripture that, that Hugh talks about Hugh, here includes not just what we understand to be scripture, but he also includes within this accounts of saints' lives and writings of the fathers of the church. So that many of the examples of a moral sense of scripture actually come from imitating the saints. This reading of scripture has less said about it because it seems to be uh, a little more difficult, a little more challenging for students. So he says, this action is for the perfect and it comes after our study. So everything we study is a preparation for the greater goal of knowing God. And only through contemplation do we begin to understand who we are and what God desires for us. By contemplating what God has made, we realize what we ourselves ought to do. So turning to a broader vision of education for human transformation in Hughes, Hughes writings and then in Bonaventure. In addition to understanding scripture through these three ways of interpretation, Hugh also uses these three readings as ways to understand the world. 
looking at the world, looking at creation leads us to contemplate the creator. But that contemplation, that study of creation also has to follow the proper formula, the proper structure as he gave for scripture. So he talks in a, a little work called On the Three Days, he talks about the, the three senses of scripture applied to creation. So that when we look at creation in a historical sense, we see in it the power, wisdom, and goodness of the creator. We then look at it allegorically to see what it teaches us about God. And what we learn is that through reason, we know who we are, we understand our own nature, and then we contemplate God's nature. Our human nature, which is both body and soul, provides a gate or a way, a road to contemplate God. Hugh in this area discusses both the nature of the Trinity and the mission of the Son. This section is the allegorical reading, the deeper meaning of things that's uh, in addition to the literal meaning of the symbol, the literal meaning of creation. Creation then leads us to the third reading of, of it, the tropological or moral lens through which we see creation. It returns our contemplation back to the world in which we live. And having contemplated who we are, who God is, then when we turn to our life, when we turn to action in the world, we begin to know what we should do. We see the light of awe of God, the light of truth and the light of love. And it's that love, that last one, that helps us understand what we should do. And so Hugh says in the Didascalicon, study can be a practice for you. It is not your objective. Instruction is good, but it is for beginners. You, however, have dedicated yourself to perfection, and therefore it is not enough for you if you put yourself on a level with beginners. It is fitting for you to manage more than this. Think where you are, and you will easily recognize what you ought to do. We can see Hugh's thought reflected in Bonaventure in the Reduction of the Arts to Theology. The final paragraph of the Reduction of the Arts to Theology states the following. I'm going to read the whole thing, and I have put some excerpts from it on the screen. Um, the first quotation is from something else. Two things are necessary, namely knowledge of the truth and the practice of virtue. It's an almost word for word uh, quotation from Hugh of St. Victor. And then from the very last paragraph of On the Reduction of the Arts to Theology. And so it is evident how the manifold wisdom of God which is clearly revealed in sacred scripture, lies hidden in all knowledge and in all nature. It is clear also how the divisions of knowledge are servants of theology. And it is for this reason that theology makes use of illustrations and terms pertaining to every branch of knowledge. It is likewise clear how wide the illuminative way may be and how the divine reality itself lies hidden within everything which is perceived or known. And this is the fruit of all sciences, that in all faith may be strengthened, God may be honored, character may be formed, and consolation may be derived from union of the spouse with the beloved, a union which takes place through charity, a charity in which the whole purpose of sacred scripture and thus of every illumination descending from above comes to rest, a charity without which all knowledge is vain because no one comes to the Son except through the Holy Spirit, who teaches all the truth, who is blessed forever. So finally, we come to some applications for today. Theological education today exists in a world with many challenges. And as educators, we try to prepare our students to meet them. As I was reflecting on the challenges that I see especially at the end of a semester of teaching theology. I think about the polarization within our church and within our world, the rapid rate of change of technology, of 
of, well, the world is changing very, very quickly. I think of globalization, the way that we are connected throughout the world, seen perhaps most clearly in the time of pandemic when we saw disease spread throughout the world very quickly. And we also saw the ways that we could connect with one another through technology. The increasing separation between the rich and the poor and the depletion of our environment. I think that Hugh of St. Victor and Bonaventure offer us some means to address some of these issues in our students and in ourselves. One of the ways is to expand our knowledge. Skimpy knowledge is not a pleasant thing. So what is it that we need to learn more about? And how do we encourage ourselves and others to be open to ideas and perceptions that are different from the ones we have? and how those ideas might lead us to God. I think we learn from them to allow book knowledge and experiential knowledge to work together for greater understanding. Both scripture and the created world lead us closer to God. I think we learn that education has to shape not just minds, but also hearts, and that our knowledge isn't really known to us until it is shaped, until it has shaped our morality, our daily behavior. And I think we also have to take seriously the idea that greater knowledge can help us bring about the kingdom of God, can help in this work of restoration of the human person. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Merceau. That was really, uh, and not only enlightening, but rather delightful. I love your, your style. <laughs> this opportunity is brought to you by the Franciscan School of Theology. We thank you for joining us this evening. Let us please give Dr. Juliet Merceau a round of applause. <laughs>